Good day, everybody. Please forgive the shirt. It's falling apart. It's a lazy shirt today. Um, so I thought that today we would do something that I've been seeing happening recently without the tools. <laughs> and that's a uh, base ID reprogramming repair. Essentially, what we're going to do is practice for if and when we actually do get the JC1000S with the base ID reprogramming module on it, as well as the cables and all that stuff. So, as some of you may know, let's switch your camera, big duh. This dot projector is something that fails quite often. And up until recently, there has been no solution at all for it. Um, if it's dead, it's tied by serial number to the logic board, and that's that. So, I want to give a little explanation of a couple of doubts that I have first with this. And this is kind of serious, let's have a talk about what's going on. Why does this fail? Um, that's a wonderful question. And there's some reasons that I've talked to some other people about that really make sense to me. One, this is a laser, this is an infrared laser that's shooting little focused dots all over your face. And what it's doing is getting a 3D image of your face, essentially, with different focal points and all that stuff, cameras, whatever it does, it's magic to pick up your face. Now, infrared laser, that's a laser you can't see. Even if this is a laser that you can see, this is dangerous for your eyeballs. And, well, there are lots of regulatory things when it comes to classes of lasers, eye exposure, over time eye exposure, all that stuff. So it could be happening. There is the dot projector, the flood illuminator infrared camera. The flood illuminator is something that will become damaged by liquid quite often because a little liquid will come in through the earpiece and get on a couple of the pins, they'll stop working. And it seems like a fair amount of time if that becomes liquid damage, then this dot projector will also die. Why is that? Well, let's think about this. A flood illuminator um, will, to me, that sounds like it's a floodlight, illuminates your face. So your infrared camera is seeing a general infrared picture of your face. And then it's going to have high points with your dots on your face. Now, there is going to be a little scatter with the dot projector, for sure. If it's a little dirty, if the lens is dirty, it's going to be a little scattering on your face and a general illumination. Now, my guess with how laser technology would like work like this is that it starts at a very low output and it only uses what is required to, um, you know, get the scan. And it just keeps ramping up until it hits its maximum limit, where then ideally software would say stop. Um, but I think what we're seeing with this is a secondary circuit internally clamping shut, failing, fusing the fuse will go out in it. So the secondary circuit, that's the emergency backup if for some odd reason software fails to stop it from amplifying too much, it has a physical fail safe in it. This is a very common feature in medical equipment as well. There are several different um, fail safes to stop injury happening to a person, to a client, to a user, to whatever it may be. If this is a ground protection circuit, if this is a uh, a double sensing circuit to make sure that both sensing circuits are within a certain percentage of each other for exits of different types of equipment. It, it's a very common thing. And this is a laser that's shining in your eyes. So that would be a very reasonable assumption of why this would fail is when you're turning on a phone, if your flood illuminator isn't working, if it's blocked, if something's happening, um, automatically it'll ramp up to its maximum or it might overshoot its ramp with trying to get enough light out because it's trying to get the flood as well as the dots to have a bright enough brilliance, yeah, bright, bright enough image for the infrared camera. And then it will pick that up and say, okay, we got the signal. Now, if it overshoots that ramp for whatever reason, calibration, not really sure how it's working. I'm assuming that this has a MOSFET in it that will fuse uh, or some, some sort of a component on the ribbon cable, which is something that we take off and we bridge it to fix that. Now here's the honest talk. <laughs> are we getting rid of a protection feature? Are we bypassing a protection feature? Is this good? Is it safe? 
I don't know the answer to this question. Over four years of using this device, unlocking your face ID, is there going to be times where it amplifies the laser too much to where it could start causing eye problems over the future? I don't know. Um, I think that's one of the reasons I'm not going to jump on board with actually doing it because I don't want people to potentially lose their eyesight because of, well, the laser control circuit not having the proper protection in it and there being that possibility where too much of invisible infrared radiation is going into your eyes when you're trying to unlock your iPhone. Focused beams. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk about first. Um, that's how I understand this is kind of working because just changing and reprogramming a chip to do a bypass, kind of like an arson if you want to be, except with the serial number of the dot projector. Uh, that's what the modified cables are and the little inserts are basically they're bypassing, hey, this is, yeah, okay, we're paired and you rewrite it with your JC flash room and all that. Um, so that is my serious disclaimer I would like to mention to everyone about this first. And please be careful if you're doing this. Know that there might be some risks that we don't fully understand. I don't have a watt meter. I don't have a laser meter. I don't have an ability to actually ramp this up and see where it will stop emitting light radiation or infrared radiation. Um, radiation is a scary word, um, infrared waves. So OK, that's that. So, Let's go ahead and start playing around with it and practicing to see if this is something that is feasible. It is something that is feasible and what it's going to take to actually get it done. And I'm going to pause for now because the client just came. So, move this to a better position. <clears throat> oh, I'm probably going to be coughing a little bit now. So where are we starting? Let's start with this guy. And let's open it up. So, get your, oh, is that a good profile? That's a good profile. Your flat nips. And well, I guess let's get some more light on this. Microscope in view? Yes, it is. Zoom out a little. All right. We're in scene. We're here. You will notice that this is already dirty. You do not want to get this dirty. Uh, it actually looks a little liquid damaged. That looks terrible. So, we're going to clean it now once to practice not getting it dirty. <clears throat> Let's not use a Q-tip I just dropped on the ground. A lot of my favorite Q-tips. Does anyone else have a brand that's just like, I need this brand of Q-tips? I know I am. So this one looks like it will never work just for how bad it looks. Interesting. Wonder why it looks like that. Well, regardless, let's go ahead and take this out. So it's a good idea to wear gloves. You know what? Let's practice it with a glove on at least. Because <clears throat> you don't want the oils of your fingers getting on anything. And zoom out, Let's try to zoom up. Grab there. Did we get it? We did not get it, okay. I started at the bottom corner of it. To rip up that weld. You can see this? You can see this. Once you got that. Imagine that you're pretty much golden.
Okay. So while we're here, <clears throat> we will grab some flat pliers and actually get that back into a shape that we want for when we're closing it. Pretty good. Okay. <clears throat> so, 190 degrees. Oh, I'm sorry about my little coffin. Hundred ninety by ninety. Why not? We're going to try. So, what we have here is um, this little part. It's glued down to the crystal. Do I do the top or the bottom? I think we're going to try to get our blade in right down here and lift up. Oh, look at that. The glue's actually like halfway done already. So, we're going to heat it up a little. I would love to have something to help hold this. How you doing? Right, we're going to grab this here. Of course, these forceps are trash. <clears throat> to be expected. It'll kind of help a little. There we go. So I just popped off of there. So, you see the circular lens right there? Oh my, what came off the side of that? Huh, that is not what you want to come off. I believe that that is wrecked, R-E-K-T, wrecked. Could be wrong. Doesn't look right to me, though. It sure is beautiful, though, isn't it? So, regardless, this little lens here, that is where you have your... I see, with all the very fragile elements all around it. And by I see, I mean your LED array or what, laser, yes, this chip. So if you go in from the top to pull up, that's a good idea. You might actually want to go in from over here on this side, above your, basically your jumpers to the front of the crystal to lift it up. Or the prism, I say crystal. That's very interesting. So we're going to continue along like that didn't affect anything. Though I have a very strong feeling that it will. And what are we going to do next? So ultimately we're going to end up pulling that off of the flex. So we're going to go ahead and tape this down. So that we can work on it a little. Uh, 
And this I see right in the middle, the square. This one right here has to come up. That's what shorts. So we're going to go to the big microscope. Make sure it's in focus. You really can't see. It's pretty black. It's right there in the center. I have a huge fat tip on this. I'm going to go up to 300. Drop the air down to 50 and see what happens. So I'm actually going to physically flick this guy off using this capacitor as my leverage. Try to get the blade in under there. Nothing. Oh well, the whole yeah, the cap's coming off. The um, the whole top assembly there was moving, so maybe I want some higher airflow on this. Come on, pop off. There we go. Okay. That cap, not ideal that it moved. I was thinking that I could protect it with the um, razor blade tip. My English is not working very well today, but apparently and obviously I was very well. Go ahead and clean this up a little bit. We want to close this guy back on there. Yeah, my soldering. Now, huh, you want to use a very, very, very small amount of flux. Can I even do a small amount of flux? No. So, I just put a little glob of flux here. Uh, I'm going to cheat, huh, cheat, get a little uh, solder paste. So oh, that's a lot of solder paste. So, got some solder paste down here, I'm going to grab it. Did not grab it. Uh, we, we are going to grab just the smallest amount of flux to go bleep. That still might be a little excessive. I'm actually going to use this to tin my wire. It is tinned. We're going to get the wire soaked with some solder. For this, I'm using 0.009 millimeter. It's a lot smaller than I really need, but that is all right. Shove you there. <coughs> 650 is excessive. We're going to turn our tip down to 550. Come now. Then 
did not do exactly as I was hoping. So when I do have issues with um, tinning a pad, generally what, wow, that's a lot more than I need. What I will do is put some solder paste on the pad that I want to tin directly. So we don't want to get solder paste all over this. So I'm going to grab a couple of these little balls I just formed. I've seen some other awesome people do this, like Mr. Swedish Chef. And I would say it works really well. So, do that, yes. I'm going to go ahead and definitely tin up this pad. You know what? 515 not working. We're going to go up to 650. Okay. I'm going to get that cat back on me. So, this... It's not good. Solder paste all over my finger. This I see that we just took off. I can't tell you what it is exactly, but it has three feet. <laughs> I just lost my dirt. And, um, well, three feet tells me some sort of a switch. My elders, that was bad. Some sort of a switch. Now, if that's the MOSFET security something, whatnot, that's being told to turn on, Possibly and probably. Did I just... Wow, did... You really went... Okay. Not the best of soldering jobs. Please forgive me. stupid and try to clean. Oh, that sounds terrible. I don't know what's going to happen with time if the um, flux is going to bleed around a little. By bleed, I mean drip. Wow, that could have been soldered on there so much better. But you know what? When in doubt, check it out. Okay, so. I really think that that is soldered down and it just moved a little. That is not going anywhere. So, let's go to 240, uh, 250. This is probably too high of a temperature. But we're gonna slide this off this idea.
275. Now, let me point out something that I noticed that I was being lazy about. There's a sticker on the side of it that we're just going to go take off now so it doesn't get caught. This is not coming up. Hmm. Huh. I almost just completely destroyed it. Really, this cable? You've already plugged into your programmer and you've already read. Of course, you've already read the important data off of it that you need. So this cable is not useful anymore. It's a uh, ideal release. It's trash. Not to say that you should get solder paste all over your thumb. But doesn't matter. <clears throat> Stick better, please. Cheated, we got under it and we clicked it up. So with that, we can see what was under it. No, don't get, don't get your pick on that. These little gold wires are extremely fragile, by the way. If you didn't assume that. You can. If you touch one of those, it's pretty much game over. So, for the sakes of practice, let's go ahead and put it on this one. First, we're going to do a little touch-up with UV coating. So this is the disposable part here. So when you're buying the kit, I guess there's actually two different kits right now for it. One of them is a sandwich. That basically, you go ahead and you stick the chip here, and then you put your dot projector back on top of it. And the other one is actually a completely new flex that has a programmable chip on it. So, let's see, where am I getting this stuff right here. And let's go to the fun painting, the fun painting screen. When I am about to paint something, what I will do is 
get some paint a little bit away from what I'm doing. And then bring it over a little bit at a time. If you need to, yes, you can always go ahead and scrape it off. If you put a little too much on after curing. But honestly, I think the easiest thing is just don't put too much on. Okay, okay. Go ahead and cure that for a moment. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so it was a very interesting process. Um, I'm sure if you practice and do it many, many times, oh, it's that time of day, isn't it? There we go. I'm sure if you practice many, many times, you will be able to get this down to an art. It will take minutes, not necessarily hours, which is what you would ideally want. Now, the tip I just used, I don't really like that for things that are not um, pad repair, I should say. So pad prep, pad prep. Oh, that's hot. I don't like to use that one. I use my KN tip. My T30 KN. Turn that back on. And what we're going to do is get some fresh solder on these pads. Now, I don't know all these pads do. Let's see if there's any easy, obvious grounds. Are these bottom ones ground? Nope. Wow. Okay. So, I was thinking that these bottom and border pads would be support pads, just like a physical holding it there. They're not. I did not see any pads obviously shorted together. Now, there must be some pads that are, but it looks like each individual pad is going to need its own, uh, own solid connection to our this guy. So, let's get Gold old gallop of solder flux on this. Solder flux. Psh. Flux on this. We can clean this. We're not worried about that. 650, I feel, is quite high for a flex cable. You do not want to linger on this for very long. That is because if you do, you are going to bubble your ribbon. Bubbling ribbon is not good. Okay, that seems plenty to me. There's two pretty high spots there. These guys look like they're all going to have good. Hopefully it's going to sit down. We're going to leave that amount of flux on or not? I'm going to do a quick little wipe. And leave about that amount of flux on it. Half the flux. So I'm going to go to 75 again. I'm going to clean this off. Mm 
make sure we have the right orientation. Now, I normally like to push this kind of thing down to make sure it's very well seated. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to do that with this one, Matt. But, I'll tell you what, we're about to find out. And if we're pushing, we're pushing either here in the center, or we're going to be pushing on this IC up here. Once again, not down on the glass laser package. Um, 80, I feel that's a little too high of an airflow. I'm going to go down to 50. Should happen pretty fast, to be honest. There it is. Jumped into place. I'm going to let it cool for a momento. And then put my pressure down and reflow. If I change my mind, I'm going to do it right here. So I see some solder popping out. That means it is blown underneath of it. I have never personally had an issue with pad shorting underneath of me. Um, really any IC, any QFN type of package that I do this with, I have never personally had anything short. If you have, tell me about it. And uh, what do you do to prevent that? as well as make sure that you have a solid connection underneath of your QFN packets. So this guy didn't move at all through any of the process besides at the beginning. Even now, trying to fry it, he's not moving. So, what is this big border for? It looks like a big ferrite coil of some sort. I'm going to ask some people about that. Let's go ahead and clean it up a little bit. Around the edges. I'm going to grab my pointy tweezers. And twist. I'm going to get the tip into the Q-tip I just cut. And twist. So Brian, our little four-legged child, we clean his ears quite often. This is kind of how I prepare the cleaning solution for his ears. Except I use him as that. He's a little English bulldog, and they get dirty ears. Dirty ears are no good for any dog. Okay, so this would be the new cable now. You grab your, actually, this is clean, this is clean, put it down there. Aha, uh -huh, stick you there. So we would go ahead and plug this into our programmer, reprogram it, beep, and then the alignment and gluing process, which sounds pretty terrible. Sounds like one of the harder parts of the job. Perfect, just like that. Yeah, this is something that I have no idea about this part of it. I would say somewhere right around there. So something else that might be a good practice to do is score the back of your camera so that you can see the parallel line on it. Now the reason that I'm kind of choosing where I do choose is because we have these um, three lines coming up over there that kind of know where they go. There. 
right there. So, let me message somebody about this. See what he says about this ring that stayed on it. Let's get a pretty picture of this while we're here. You see some dust on it. Dust bad. Oh, some of that stuff is just on there, though. Interesting. Um, I'm going to tack this on for now. I'll tell you exactly I'm going to tack it on for now. I'm going to grab some of my conformal coating. Enough of the conformal coating, is it? On move conformal coating. of it to bind a little. Darn it. <laughs> well, that's a failed attempt. So we're going to go grab something like B7000. I'll be right back. By B7000, I mean T7000, because I don't have B7000. Let's go ahead and clean this up a little bit again. Clean all this terrible adhesive off that I just got on it. Not even adhesive. Ink. I was kind of hoping that the ink might be like slightly sticky with the intention that then I could put something over top of it.
So you'll notice that I was trying to squeeze down on it, and when doing that, I'm making sure that I don't get the lens on the other side of it. And the squish. Right there is where I want it. So with my gloves, I'm okay with squeezing down on that lens, right? Oh no. So, now to align where I want it, let's go ahead and try not to drop a camera while doing this big desk. There we go. And squish. So now, what I say we do is wait, wait for it to dry, and I believe, actually I don't even know if we uh, squish that down, I have a feeling that we might just want to break that off, because it is not going down well. There, done, off. In that case, we do need to add some extra adhesive around our edges once it is aligned. This will definitely be an experimenting thing. I have a feeling that it would be good for a little goop here. And a little goop here. Probably a little goop down here. And then to let it settle. So. Awesome. Seems like it's pretty successful. Um, is this a service that I would offer? Big, big GoPro. Beautiful lights. And might as well do it right there. Is this a surface that I would offer? Um, I don't know. I might honestly pick up some sort of a low power watt meter that can test for ultraviolet light. Um, laser. I don't know what this is supposed to be outputting. I don't know what a safe amount for eyeballs is. Um, as many of us know, I don't actually have an iPhone 10 screen here with me, but here, um, is it gonna do it? Let's see. Yeah, okay, so you can see flashing. Um, the dot projector on this one isn't the original dot projector. And when you replace the screen, you'll notice it has a little film on it. A weird coloring, ultra... It's kind of like a reflective film. And if you haven't studied or know much about um, wavelength filtration, I believe that that's a wavelength filter for the harmful radiation for your eyes. There is, it's an infrared radiation in a laser form. Um, that if your dot projector is too cold, that should be filtering it out. Um, because sometimes the actual mechanism that creates the laser itself with different temperatures, the crystal inside of it will contract or expand and actually generate a different frequency that isn't meant to. So, worst case scenario, we've bypassed a safety circuit that's already decided it wasn't safe. Is that responsible? And secondary, um, in the future, or maybe even you yourself will use a very low quality copy screen, a screen that doesn't have that filter, just has a little sticker over it to make it look like it's got all the cool original things in it. And then they're skiing or snowboarding or it's cold outside or I guess who skis or snowboards with their iPhone, but okay. It's very cold outside, they left their phone in their car for an hour while doing who knows what, they pull out their phone to open up their face ID and the laser blasts full without the extra filtration that it should have in it 
and the user is getting harmful radiation from a laser and directly in their eyeballs and lots of little points, focused points in their eyes. And that scares me. Um, I have not made up my mind yet if this is something that I want to do or not, I'll be honest. Um, obviously, as a profitability, it'd be great. Um, technically, it seems like we can do it. Um, Oh, what's the English word for this? Ethically? Yes, ethically. I want to see a little bit more research and a little bit more of what's going on behind of it. Behind it, I think that we need to be cautious with it, and I would love to have some sort of a laser verification of the power that's actually being output with this new cable on it, the bypass of this other um, internal component, probably some sort of a safety MOSFET. Um, and kill switch basically. Yeah, that's pretty much where I stand with it. But thanks for experimenting with me. That was fun. I enjoyed it. And well, I hope that you have the confidence to try out new things and experiment with your um, your donor devices that hopefully you've purchased just to mess around with and to figure out how to break things and how not to break things. Because honestly. You're going to learn how not to pull a pad by pulling pads. Um, you're going to learn how not to bubble a flex by bubbling a couple of flexes and realizing that you should turn your temperatures down to this or up to this and that kind of stuff. So thank you very much. Hope you have a great whatever you're having right now. And well, we'll catch you guys next time.